Hey everyone, uh, my name is Leo Guerra. I'm from the privacy team here at Google. Thank you for coming to this Authors at Google talk. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Uh, he's born and raised just down the road in Palo Alto. Tad Williams has um, held more jobs than any sane person would care to admit to. Uh, he's done singing in a band, selling shoes, managing a financial institution, throwing newspapers, and designing military manuals, just to name a few. As a writer, he has been one of fantasy's most beloved and brightest stars over 30 years, and has written such bestsellers as Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn series, uh, the, Over the Other Land series, and the Shadow March series. He's here, to he's here today to talk to us about Happy Hour in Hell, the latest book in his critically acclaimed Bobby Dollar series. Please welcome Tad Williams. Thank you. Um, what I'm actually here today to talk to you guys about is pretty much anything we want to talk about. Um, I have some slightly formal type things I could do, like actually do a reading. Um, but I'm also perfectly happy just to ask, answer questions. Um, I can ask questions, actually. I can do that, too. Um, so I'm fairly casual any which way. Um, do you guys want to hear some reading, or do you want to just me just to talk about stuff? I mean, I'm very informal with these things. So. Some of you seem to be familiar with my work already. The gentleman here has already made a, 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 a sarcastic remark about my inability to make deadlines, so he clearly, <laughs> has, he clearly knows something about me. Um, so I'm just curious if anybody has any preferences in terms of what they want. You guys, I'm putting you on the spot early, okay? So, you know, I'm gonna expect yeah. feedback here, so. Anybody, you want a reading, you want to? Yeah. yeah, okay. I'll read a little section from the, the, the uh, first Bobby Dollar book. Um, because then I don't have to explain all the different things. Well, I still have to explain, but I don't have to explain as much. Um, the most important thing to realize about these books, the main character, oh, that's my, that's my badge. Um, <laughs> that is not on the cover of every book, I promise you. Um, the main character in these books is um, an angel. He's an earthbound angel. He works for the heavenly bureaucracy, and his job is more or less to uh, act as an advocate or a public defender for the souls of the recently dead. And in the course of doing this normally, he has a fairly normal sort of on earth life. He has an earth body, he has earth friends, but he's mostly, he mostly hangs out with other angels who are doing the same kind of thing. The book also takes place, just in case there's references to it, in the, uh, in the peninsula area, but it is a, uh, an imaginary version where, for my own sake, because I was writing a kind of a noir crime-ish thing, I, I, I needed an urban area. I needed a, a city to be a good setting for um, anything that has kind of a noir tint to it. And because of that, um, I invented a city because I grew up in the suburbs and it just doesn't work for noir because then, you know, if you stand on a corner looking mysterious in, in, in the suburbs, the police come over and go, what are you doing? Um, so I invented a city called San Judas. I basically took San Jose, you know, kind of a million strong and kind of dragged it up to, to the Redwood City, Palo Alto area, which is what I'm most familiar with. Anyway, so Bobby in this, I think the other character that shows up in this is Clarence who is a young journeyman angel, and Clarence has lots of questions because he is just learning how to do this stuff. So, okay, so Bobby has just finished having an argument, um, just finished arguing on behalf of a recently deceased soul, and that's what's going on at the moment, and he's, Clarence is, ta Clarence is accompanying him, because Clarence is a new angel. Um, but he wasn't a bad guy, Clarence told me afterward as we grabbed a burger at a roadside diner. Why did you agree to purgatory? Because even though it was only a property crime, it was a breach of trust, and eh, this can go pretty severely. You don't know Ramile the way I do. Ramile was the judge you'd been assigned to Crosley's case. For a being made entirely of holy light, he kind of had a stick up his ass. Trust me, our boy will do that time in purgatory standing on his head. But these are people's lives, Clarence said, so concerned to make his point, he didn't notice the tomato and onions sliding out the back of his burger into his lap. No, these are whole, they're whole eternities in our hands. He looked down and frowned, then began trying to wipe the mess away with a pitifully inadequate napkin. Exactly, I said, they're in our hands. In fact, that's kind of the job description. So, 
it's better to lose small than take a risk of losing big. I did my best to explain to him that I'd tried it his way first, going after each case like a high school football coach trying to lead his underdog team to a big win, but I could tell by the way he looked at me that it just wasn't getting through. He couldn't see it. Which meant that if Clarence was really what they claimed he was, a new advocate in training, he'd have to learn the hard way like the rest of us had. See, heaven's judges have their own ideas and don't like being lectured on how morality should work. In fact, they pretty much consider themselves to be the literal definition of morality, and they have the power to back that up. A series of agonizing failures taught me the most important lesson of all, which is do what you can, take what you can get, try to grow scar tissue over the parts that get hurt. If you can't get the judge to see it your way, you must take any little victory you can get. I mean, nobody likes to settle for purgatory, but it beats the hell out of betting on a long shot and losing, because these are people we're gambling on, human souls. It hurts bad when I lose a case, but it hurts them much worse than it does me. Hey, Clarence, I asked as I pulled my jacket on, you want to ride home? I wish you'd stop calling me that, he said. I've seen it's a wonderful life, you know. I mean, I get it. And when you earn your wings, we'll stop calling you Clarence and start calling you Harold or Harry or whatever your name's supposed to be. Harrison, he said, sulking a little. Harrison Eli. Yeah, I guess I'd like a ride. It turned out that poor Clarence actually rode the bus to work when Sam didn't pick him up. An angel on one of those smog belching city buses, can you imagine? I swear I'd walk first. And then skipping just ahead a little bit. And now Bobby is returning to his apartment. The moment I walked through the door of my motel room, I could feel the baking heat as if I had left the thermostat set at 125 when I went out. Then the smell hit me, so savage and so wrong that I took a couple of stumbling steps backward through the doorway, waving my hand in front of my face. And that was what saved me. The thing waiting in the room smashed into the half-open door and the impact tore the top hinge out of the wall so that the door sagged crookedly in its frame. An instant later, my visitor stepped on the broken door and crushed it into a splintering mess as it forced its way out onto the concrete walkway like an octopus flying out of a tiny crevice, flowing out of a tiny crevice in the rocks. But this was no octopus or anything else I'd ever seen. It was vaguely man-shaped, but huge, almost eight feet tall, and so dark that even by the parking lot lights, I could barely make it out except for spreading horns on its head and a sloping, complicated muzzle that made it look a bit like some abstract sculpture of a minotaur. Even from a few feet away, the heat it threw off was painfully intense. There was no question of trying to stand up to something like this. I turned and sprinted across the motel parking lot, I could hear it galloping right behind me, shedding bits of splintered door as it came. So I dove under somebody's sports car, sports wagon, and deliberately tried to claw my, desperately tried to claw my gun out of my waistband holster, which is no easy trick while you're lying on your belly crammed under a greasy SUV. The thing still wasn't making a noise except for its deep grunting breaths. That's good, I thought. If it's breathing, maybe it can be hurt. But it knew exactly where I was, and it was very interested. It circled the wagon, then a big hot hand suddenly swept underneath and missed my head by only a few inches. I swear I felt my eyebrows crisping as if someone had tried to close a waffle iron on my face. An instant later, the thing simply bent down and heaved the whole car up in the air, lifting it so that only two wheels still touched the ground. I didn't want to find out what would happen if it dropped it again with me underneath, so I rolled to one side and finally was able to pull my revolver. I emptied it into the middle of the thing, all five slugs. I can't believe I missed from that close, but as far as I could tell, it did nothing but stagger the creature a bit and startle it into dropping the wagon, which bounced on its big tires as I took the opportunity to scramble farther away. We were making a lot of noise. As the echoes of my shots died, lights were coming on all over the building. I had no idea what was after me, but I didn't want any ordinary people getting mixed up in this. From what I'd seen, my assailant would go through them like they were made of butter. My decision was hastened by a huge horned shadow scrambling over the wagon toward me. Later on, the police who investigated the scene would decide that the car had been vandalized with a blowtorch and a pickaxe, 
but I was there. Those marks were made by fingers and toes or hooves or whatever it ran around on. The screech of punctured metal was enough to tell me what would happen if it ever grabbed me, so I jumped up and sprinted across the parking lot and out into the lights of the busy Camino Real, fumbling for my speed loader as I dodged startled, honking motorists. This, this is why I hate carrying a gun, by the way. As soon as I've got it, I suddenly keep needing it. Most witness reports afterward describe something like a gigantic black bear in a Halloween wig chasing a man through traffic and at one point leaping over an entire cab, which had fishtailed to, fish to a stop behind a clutch of startled drivers. A lone dissenter insisted that not only had the man also jumped over the cab, he was being chased not by a bear, but, quote, by a giant gorilla in some kind of Viking hat, unquote. Other than that guy, nobody but me seemed to have noticed the impressive sweep of horns. I reached the other side of the Camino Real about a second and a half in front of the burning black shape. I was almost weeping with anger at my own stupidity in having stayed in the same place two nights in a row, and I was gasping for air as well, but I didn't dare stop. I was pretty certain my aim hadn't been the problem with my shoot the fucking thing idea, and I didn't have a new idea yet, so I kept running until I reached the used car lot across the street. Instead of diving under another vehicle, I didn't trust the clearance on any of the economy models sitting there, I ran right toward the showroom window, feeling the thing closing on me from behind as if it were a rolling ball of lightning. A set of talons as wide across as a garden rake whooshed over my head. As I felt my hair sizzle, I reflected that at least I had a pretty good idea now what had marked my door. At the last moment, I juked sideways and by some miracle kept my feet, but the monstrous whatever it was had too much mass to turn that quickly and crashed full on into the 10 by 30 plate glass window with a noise like a bomb going off in Chartres Cathedral. By the time the thing dug its way out of the wreckage, I was crouching on the bumper of the number 35 bus on the other side of the Camino Real, heading south. I could dimly see the shadow snorting and sniffing in the ruins of the showroom, but apparently it didn't see me clinging to the bus's rear quarter panel, struggling for breath while I bled gently down the Caltrans logo and onto the asphalt that was sliding away beneath me. It doesn't really count as riding the bus because I didn't buy a ticket. <laughs> now, I'm very happy to talk about anything, whether about um, the stuff I'm writing now, other things I've written, writing in general, science fiction, fantasy, anything anybody wants. So anybody have a question? Any kind, whatsoever. One question is, how do you keep personality of characters individual, right? Because at some point, it's, it must be hard to know that they don't always reflect your own personality or blend together. I think it is. The, the, the question is, how do you, yeah, yeah how, how do you keep characters separate and individual? Um, and the, the thing is, in most cases, that is a, more of an issue. In the Bobby Dollar books, uh, more probably than any character I've written, he, he is very similar to me. He's not exactly me, by any means. But his approach, his um, way of looking at the world, you know, his habit of using uh, humor as a way to cope with things is very much mine. As far as, in general, when characters are, are not me or not like me, um, what really has to happen is you have to, you have to give the character their credibility. Once you create somebody, once you have the basic integuments of that character, um, they, you will have to treat them as though they are real people. So what that means is once you form the basics of their character, you have to let them begin to make their own choices, or at least tell you what they would be likely to do in that situation. Which can be a real pain in the ass, believe me, because there are times when you invent a character solely for some purpose far off in the story, you know, like especially in some climactic moment where, you know, they're going to jump in front of the main character and take a spear or something and save your main character. And so you can't just invent them at the last moment, right? I mean, that's the Star Trek red shirt thing. Everybody knows that. You know, you have to put them in the story earlier. And if they have no personality, then everybody is going to you know, either spot them as a, a, a born to die character or they're just not going to care you know, because they're clearly a, you know, a spear carrier, they're a walk-on. So you also have to start early and give them a personality and let them begin to develop. 
which is all cool, except the problem is, is then sometimes you get to that point near the end of the story, and you, the character essentially will talk to you and say, I ain't jumping in front of nobody. <laughs> you know? Just not going to happen here. And uh, which is why I have lots of other characters, because you just jerk some other poor idiot out of the back row and go, you're a star, boom, you know, and put them in there to take the spear. But no, it does happen. And, but it's vital. You have to take that chance that a character will not do what you want to, to keep the characters idiosyncratic, to keep them real, to let the little weird little things you thought of in the beginning really take shape and inform that character. But the nice thing is once you do start writing them, once you give them these basic elements, they do start to become real to you. You know, they become real in such a way that you, you can kind of let them make their choices or show you what they do or suggest what their own backstory is. And I have oftentimes um, literally found out who the character was by sort of doing a psychological overview of who they are. And that's told me, okay, they must have come from this kind of a history and had this kind of a outlook on the world because of things that happened when they were young and, you know, so there's a real value to it and to letting them have their way. So when you write a story with multiple main characters, do you, do you tend to see it mostly from the perspective of one and then you revise it by saying, does that make sense from the perspective of the other? Or you're a third party that looks at both of them as you write uh, do I see it mostly through the perspective of a, a, the, the, the main character? No, what actually happens, and if you look at my, if you look at the kind of stuff I do, especially the big books, that what usually will happen is that I will um, deliberately create focal point characters so that I can be in lots of different sort of theaters of operation. When I'm doing like one of my big epics, what I like to do is to show the size of things um, by personalizing them. Because I discovered early on that unlike, say, Tolkien or some other writers, um, I don't particularly feel comfortable in the, the all-seeing narrator voice and standing back and describing to the reader, you know, from a godly point of view, what's happening. That has never been as interesting for me, for one thing, because I probably just don't know enough to do that. So what I've always done instead is try to um, find a character to tell it through. So then all those different locales or viewpoints or plot lines become very personalized. And they take on kind of the lens of the character who's viewing them. So for me, it's very easy to step into that character then and continue that story because they have their own story. You know, they have their own arc. And it's just like writing many, many books and weaving them together, I guess, for lack of a better way to phrase it. Um, so when you're writing a multi-part series, as you are now, how much do you know, like now, about what's going to be happening towards the end of it? You know, how, how much is it planned out in advance versus how much are you making up as you go along? Um, and how do you keep it so that each book has its own personality and it's not just like uh, an episode of a comic book series, you know, it's just, it, it isn't just one small um, piece that feels kind of unfulfilling all by itself. Well, that actually, um, that's a very big question. It's kind of a set of nesting questions. Um, and they are in fact kind of at the heart of writing uh, big epic stories of any kind. And the answer to the first part, which is about, you know, plotting everything ahead of time versus, you know, not plotting everything ahead of time is that it really is, um, it's a high wire act. It's a balancing act, you know. You think of the guys that, or gals in some cases, are walking on high wires with those big weighted poles. And as soon as they start to go one way, then, you know, they're compensating to bring themselves back to an upright gyroscopic position or whatever. Um, and that's very much what I'm doing also with writing a really big book. And the reason is because you cannot plan everything. If you're writing something that's going to take you four or five years, it's going to be half a million words in you know, one volume alone maybe, um, you cannot think all of that up ahead of time. You can, but it will be extremely forced. When I have to write, my, my outlines have been getting shorter and shorter throughout my career because I've realized that that's a real waste of time trying to figure everything out ahead of time just to tell my publishers so they'll give me money. 
So now I just tell them, just give me money and trust me. <laughs> and that works much better for me. I'm not sure about the publishers so much. But the reason is that, first of all, during the course of writing a very long story or a set of connected stories, um, I change. I find out more things about the world. I bump into interesting conversations. I meet people who serve as inspiration for characters, whatever it may be. Um, but also just the simple fact of the sort of the emergent order that comes out of complexity and chaos, or at least seeming chaos, is that to an extent the story writes itself. It goes back to the issue we were talking about with characters, is that you get enough variables going on. And at a certain point, some of those, you're going, oh my god, wait a minute, these guys and these guys are going to come together, and these guys have that goal, but these guys have that goal, so right away there's going to be tension in this particular thing. Now, who are the personalities involved? How is that going to affect whether this group is going to stay together, split, if they're going to do this, if they're going to do that, they're going to kill each other, you know. So part of it is needing to have that space for that kind of order to arise out of you know, a sufficient amount of chaos. So you want to keep uh, a lot of things at bay as long as you can until they start to click together. Unfortunately, the flip side of that is, or the other extreme, is if you don't plan at all, then you're going to have real trouble with things like, say, foreshadowing. Could you hold that for me? With foreshadowing, um, because although I write multiple volume stories, that for me they're all single stories. They're not series books, you know. So I'm writing them with the idea that basically you could sit down at the beginning and read it all through as though it was one book. Um, but publishing and printing technology of the previous century did not allow that. So, you know, I began making multi-volume books. However, because they are for me one story, I want to be able to foreshadow like I would in a normal book or, or begin to introduce themes or symbols early on in the stories. Which means you have to know something about the ending and you have to know some of the highlights of things that are going to happen along the way. Otherwise you're going to make terrible, terrible, terrible mistakes where you will get to the ending and find out like, oh my god, I should never have killed that guy off. I'm in serious trouble now, and short of going, you know, as I always say, short of going door to door with a red pen, borrowing your books back, can I, can I have that for a second, you know, and see this where this guy says he dies, okay, he's dead, no, I'm gonna cross out dead and just put breathing very shallowly here, <laughs> you know, and that's not really practical, especially not if you're going to sell enough books to make a living off of, so what I have to do is, again, I, we go back to the balancing act, where I have to make some decisions early with an idea of, okay, this is going to come back later on in some shape or form. Even if I don't know exactly how, I'm going to establish it as a point. The readers will note, they will say, ah, clearly a significant moment, he must have plans for this guy. Well, I do, but I have no idea what they are. But that's okay, because if I do this all carefully, one of the things that happens when things start to lock up is my subconscious often will go, oh, now we're going to get this guy and deal with that. Remember we set that up and we had no idea what we were doing back there? Now we know. And click, it'll come in and I've hopefully, I get to the final volume and everybody goes, wow, how did he know, man? He just fitted all that stuff back together. And it's mostly smoke and mirrors. So, <laughs> so that answers the first part. Was there anything else there in that question that I didn't? My, my second part of the question was, was about making sure that each volume of a multi-part series has its own personality and it doesn't just feel like a small fraction of a whole story, but then you, then you went on to say, well, it is a small fraction of a whole well, story. Well, but there also, no, but that's actually a good point too because you have to, you have to um, put them together in such a way that somebody can pick up a book and feel like they've read a book instead of just the middle section of something with no re resolve or no resolutions of any kind. So I do shape them a bit to give them that feeling. The thing about that, though, is I oftentimes don't really know what se separates that book out from the previous book until I'm well into it. And that's when theme material begins to rise. I begin to see my own patterns. I begin to go, oh, OK, this book is more of a, mm, you know. This book is more of the travelogue of the country, you know. This is the book about moving through this and learning what there is. or you know, whatever it might be that turns out to be the theme. So those often come to me later. But I do try to shape each one so at least the reader 
doesn't feel like they've just been dropped off a cliff at the end, that there's some kind of... So uh, asking a little bit about, you mentioned that you got better with deadlines throughout your career and so on. So I'm curious about your, uh, how do you work? So uh, is it Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on your desk at home every day? Or are you flexible to just write while you're traveling? Is that how, what you prefer? And also, uh, if, uh, if you think you could be a full-time author, or at least make a, write a real book while working on another job, like a software engineer, for example. Well, OK, a couple of different questions there. So I'll do the more historical one first. Um, my first several books were written while I was working other jobs. I uh, wrote my very first book while working two or three other jobs. As a matter of fact, I was waiting tables. I was uh, answering phones at an all-night answering service. And I may still have been, I may have been throwing newspapers at that point. I can't remember. But the kind of absolutely pathetic, sad-ass jobs where you couldn't just have one. You know, I had to have two or three pathetic jobs all at the same time just to scrape together enough money to survive. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote my first book, which was the cat book, while I was doing many, many jobs. Um, and I wrote the next set of books while I was um, primarily working at Apple, because uh, I worked at Apple in the late 1980s, at, but it was only half time. But that was like the last normal job that I had. Um, uh, speaking of, as, as people here who work at a very, uh, a very nice company that with great benefits and all that kind of stuff, you'll be amused by what, because I had great benefits at Apple too. In fact, they were paying me full time benefits. I was working 20, 20 hours a week, and they had me scheduled into 14 hours of meetings. Yeah. So they were basically giving me full-time Apple benefits in the 1980s for six hours a week of actual expected work, which I still managed to avoid doing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yay me. Um, anyway, so yeah, I have had that experience of working. And the only thing that really helps with that is that you just have to look on the writing as something quite separate. and you. You need to have it be something positive for you. It is very difficult to write after a writing job. It is very difficult sometimes to write if you have a really physically exhausting job. But if you are going to do it while you're doing something else, it has to be a refuge. It has to be, you know, like playing a sport or or you know doing something you really love doing. You know, um, as far as how I how I work now, um, first of all, when I first went full-time, which was about 1990, I think, and I first became a full-time writer, I was terrified because I was really, really worried that I was going to wind up um, watching daytime television. You know, it's like, it's, now I have freedom, oh my god, and I've always thought of myself as being very lazy. You know, I'm sure I'm just going to be watching like Wheel of Fortune all day, you know, and horrible shit like that, you know, drinking beers and watching Oprah or whatever. Um, in fact, no. The, 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 the tragic truth is that I now, I'm never not working. So that's one thing. Um, I just, it's going on all the time. And I have to kind of suppress it to do other things, to have a normal life, to, you know, to remember to get the kids to clean their rooms or whatever. I have to go turn off the story for a minute, go do this. In terms of how I actually physically make books, um, I really work most days at least some, somewhat, even if I give, have a day when I don't write anything, I will invariably spend a lot of thinking time. But on a, a normal writing day, which I try to do four to five days a week, um, I will get up and do my sort of correspondence and things. I will then purposefully go away from the, the, the computer and will just think. And I'll think about what I'm working on, and I'll think about maybe some bits that are up the road, but I will also very definitely plan the section that I'm working on. Because for me, um, everything works better if it's in my head. So I, I like to just kind of keep it all loose and fluid, and it makes it much easier to, to try different possibilities, you know, to try little different branching things and go, well, if I do this, then that turns into this, but then I can't go over here quite so easily, so let's pull that one apart. And, so it's just basically that. It's, it's, I'm sure it's very similar to programming and a lot of other kinds of creative things. You know, you, you do thought experiments. So I will usually do that until like lunchtime, sometimes actually lying down. It took me years to, to get my family trained to understand that, yes, sometimes dad is just lazy, sometimes dad is taking a nap, but oftentimes dad is lying down because that is the most comfortable position in which to think. So 
I'll do that till like, yeah, lunchtime, have some lunch, maybe think a little bit more. And then I usually sit down and do all my writing in maybe three hours of actual writing, but because I'm prepped. I'm not sitting there staring at a screen. I'm going in with an idea of what I'm going to do, what the sort of shape of maybe that chapter is going to be, who the characters are, what highlights I want in it, you know, and I've really thought it through. And usually I've even played around with it a little bit to make things happen in the most dramatic order. So I, that's a good thing to do in your head instead of having to rewrite, is just saying, okay, well, if this happens first, then we've, we've shot the wad at the beginning of the, the section, you know? So let's hold that back a little bit. Let's build the tension. So what else could happen? Well, this could happen, and that would further another need. So that's basically it for me most days. And I'm usually done by, you know, four or five in the afternoon, but Again, I'm almost always working, so if I have, you know, after dinner or whatever, I will oftentimes just go and think or make a few notes if there's something that I want to hang on to that's concrete. Um, like I thought of a good name for a character and I want to get that down somewhere. And I lie in bed at night thinking about this stuff too. So, you know, it, it never really goes away. It's kind of there seven days a week. And I, I do a lot of driving because of it, because it's a good time to think. There's just enough occupation for the body that the mind can, my mind anyway, can sort of roam free. Do you see yourself uh, rewriting less over the years? Is that something that you used to do more and you do less nowadays or is it still part of your workflow? Interestingly enough, that's um, almost entirely project dependent with the really, really, really big books, the multi-volume series with those that I mentioned with all the complications of how do you channel everything together at the end. Those books, like 90% of the work is in the first draft because I, I have to weave everything carefully and I've got all these different timelines and things which I'm holding in my head and I'm going, okay, this and then this and then we'll weave this in and then this bit. So those are hell to pull apart if you get something wrong. You know, if you have to pull out a timeline, you know, it's like ivy. You're gonna have to rip out the entire plant, you know, to get rid of that one part. So I, I really, really plan those out very carefully, and I do an even more intensive thinking to writing ratio. But with something that like the Bobby Dollar books that I'm working on now, um, because they're told by the main character, because I don't have to worry about the things that are happening kind of off screen, as it were, I can be much more direct and fix things in rewrite. So I just storm through those, and I write faster because of that. Um, but I also do more work in the rewrite because I will actually say, eh, now that I'm reading this, I think this section needs to come earlier. It's kind of a slowdown here and I need to do it right after something exciting has happened. Or, you know, and I move things around because it's only that one character and his viewpoint. So it's, it's much easier that way. So it's, it's, it's project related. Right. You, you talked a lot about sort of process, but I, I'm, I'm really interested in sort of the earlier stages of it when, I mean, I, I've read most of your books and, and you have some very, very completely different sort of worlds. Um, how, does, how does that start? Like, how do, you, how do you take, like, you know, that spark of an idea and turn it into uh, a, a framework for a world and, 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 and a story? Well, as far as what happens with the ideas, it's actually... Um, it's funny, and I, I guess in different ways, different people, there are other people who are this way too, but I, I am somebody who the ideas are always popping up. They are a constant thing. In, in my, I, my mental image of my own brain is like, remember those little corn popper toys you used to push around when you were a <laughs> kid? That's what it looks like. There's these little colored plastic balls going pop, 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 pop in there. Ideas are given um, just because of the fact that I am who I am, I was raised the way I was raised, you know, I, I love them and I found a way to make a living off of them. But what has to happen, there's a big long stretch between having an idea and, so what tends to happen is that there's kind of a, a, a mulching process, a composting process, where when I have an idea that I actually notice and go, ooh, that's interesting, I'll just kind of throw it in the hopper and leave it there. And what happens is there's this whole kind of process going on in the subconscious where where really good ideas will stick around and they will often begin to agglomerate with other ideas, you know, and they will, in fact, sometimes they'll eat smaller, weaker ideas and, and they will, you know, they'll go like, you're not enough of an idea on your own, so I'll just swallow you, but now you're part of my, this idea. And what happens after a certain length of time is that some ideas are so involved and complex and, and alive is the best way I can say it, so sort of throbbingly alive, 
that they, they want to be written. They have gone past the first threshold. They are not just a little idea that's sitting around, they're like, oh, that'll be fun someday. You know, and they become an actual idea that is like a story. That, for me, is the first threshold. And at that point, I will kind of play around with it. I will analyze, is this a short story? Is this a film script? Is it a novel? If it's a novel, like, do I even really want to start thinking about it? Because I've already got three of them ahead of me, or whatever, you know. But again, it, it's basically, it's, it's, it's a Hobbesian nightmare in there. It's nature red in tooth and claw, and the ideas are fighting with each other for my very limited amount of, of time to actually work. And at any given time, there are two or three novel ideas in my head that will probably never get written. They will just stay in the background, and if they stay in the background long enough, eventually they will just kind of slide off. Um, you know, it's because there's only, uh, only you know, once a year at the most do I ever get to choose what new book I'm going to do. And usually I already know, because either I'm doing a series or I've been wanting to write this one for so many years that the next open slot, so it's, it's a limited amount of space. That's why I like to do shorter fiction sometimes and things, just to get some of those ideas. And, and in fact, the Otherland books, if you've read a lot of my stuff, the Otherland books had a huge amount of beloved ideas of mine that I was worried I was never going to get to write. Um, so like the house world, the world that's an endless house, that was something I'd been wanting to do for a long time, and I folded into Otherland, and, which was very much a kitchen sink book which is why I even had a kitchen in it with a giant kitchen sink, was kind of <laughs> show you how shameless I am about this stuff. So. Um, so did we get all that? For someone who doesn't have the time to do this, you know, professionally and occupy their entire time, like I know I found, I, I get ideas like that and I let them churn and mulch for a little while, but I never, you know, by the time I've gotten around and have the time to sit down and do something with it, it's gone. Right. Um, you know, is there, are there any tricks to, to keep track of You need an intermediate phase. Yeah. You need an intermediate phase, um, which is that you need a phase where you concretize those ideas in some way without it having to be a full-blown writing process. Um, so, you know, what I would suggest is that, you know, for instance, that you have something like the equivalent of a story file, and every time you have an idea like that, you put it down in whatever form you have, and then you go back to those things as you add new ones, but you, you keep looking at them. In other words, you, you develop yourself an indeterminate phase, whereas me, I've already got a, a process in place that leads to them getting finished. You need to start developing one, I would say. So, so yeah, it, but it, very important. It has to be regular because, it, to my way of thinking, you know, neural pathways, muscle memory, you know, it's all the same. You do stuff over and over again, it becomes habit, you begin to burn those, those, those neural routes, um, it begins to become reflexive, you have an automatic thing, and you start to also see things through the, the filter of now having those new pathways too. So, so find some way to use it, even if you're just you know, posting them on a blog or something, just saying, here I have these really cool ideas, any of you like these, should I do one of these? You know, anything you can do to make it more formal and more real. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. I've been reading a short story collection by Orson Scott Card, and he talks about a lot of that same type of stuff where he's just trying out stories to get ideas out. Right. And it really has been fascinating because he puts that information in and to, to see that process. And he says, you know, and some of them he goes, yeah, this one I did, and I really looked at it and said, this was really a bad idea. No place to go with it. Yeah. Um, but my question was, um, can you tell any type of specific story where you have actually written yourself into a corner um, with, like you said, one of these multi-parts, and then what did you have to do to try to get yourself back out of that situation? Uh, actually, um, more than a lot of writers, I think, I do that on purpose. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, because like many of my readers, um, I am pretty widely read. And I am pretty widely read in all the genre uh, upon which the stuff that I like impinges, you know. So, it, so, you know, I've read a lot of fantasy, a lot of science fiction, a lot of crime, a lot of mystery. Um, I also read a lot of other kinds of, you know, I read a lot of nonfiction, a lot of history and science. So I'm always writing for an audience as much like myself as I can deal with because I'm the only audience I actually can test things against. Uh, at least in time to save myself from a tragic publishing error. Mm -hmm. So what I tend to do is um, when I am testing 
the ideas on myself. Um, I find that anything that I, not anything, but quite frequently, if I put my character in a very difficult situation. And let's face it, when you're writing, let me go to the side here for just a moment, the whole thing about genre fiction, okay? Genre fiction is not a, a, uh, a quality, okay? There is no such thing as genre quality. Genre just means a type, okay? And in my way of thinking, what it actually means is it's a bargain. It's a bargain between the writer and the reader consumer or the audience or whatever you want to call it and that bargain is if I have told you or if you believe that you are getting a certain kind of genre book or story that I will at least fulfill enough of the genre conventions that you will not feel cheated. Now hopefully I will do a lot more with it than that too and that's the great thing about genre and especially science fiction and fantasy is if you give the reader enough of what they're looking for, you can also be as experimental or as literary or as anything as you want to. So, you know, I always shorthand it as every five pages something has to try to eat my main character, okay? <laughs> but, you know, it's not literally that. Sometimes every five pages something is trying to blow up my main character or to slime my main character. But the main thing is that I need those those I need to work with those genre conventions and realize that the readers are expecting a certain amount of these things and it's like a thrill ride if I don't de deliver that part nothing else matters because first and foremost most of the readers are expecting you know otherwise they could be reading anything why are they reading science fiction and fantasy now once you once you deal with those those genre expectations then you are free to do whatever you want but I also figure that most genre readers have read a ton of the kind of stuff that I'm writing. So I am constantly in a mental struggle with all of you. Any of you who are my readers, you and I are at war. You may not realize that. No, seriously. Um, and I'm going to key all your cars in the parking lot, too, because <laughs> I'm bitter about it. No, but what is going on is that I figure you guys are all really smart, too, like me, about this kind of stuff, that you've read a lot, that you think creatively. And therefore, if I can, just off the top of my head, set up a really difficult problem that can be solved by my main character, the chances are anybody could solve that. And therefore, nobody is going to feel that that's a sufficiently difficult problem to hold their attention. They're going to come to it. They're going to go, oh, well, crap, he's just going to do this. You know, I mean, like, that's what I'd do. So one of the ways to deal with there are other ways to deal with that and you know some, one is just to spend hours sitting around thinking about it trying to you know make a, a, a you know a problem with a with a great cool solution but what i find is a better way to do it oftentimes is just to write the character into a situation that i can't see any way to get out of <laughs> right because then i really 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 have to think about it i have to say oh my god he's got you know no nothing he doesn't have a a uh, camping knife, he doesn't have a piece of string, you know, he doesn't have a rock to tie the string around, he doesn't have anything. How is he going to deal with this, or she, or whoever it is? And then, you know, then I'm literally thinking the same way the reader is, but I have to come up with a solution, because I'm going to have to present that solution, and it's going to have to feel that way. So that for me is really fun. That adds that I put myself in a situation where I've got to dig my way out, and that sometimes hypes up the adrenaline as a writer enough that, that it makes me more close to what the character is going through, more ready to try anything, more uh, nothing is too crazy. What might work? So yeah, that happens all the time. In the big books, not quite as much, again, because I have to be, I have to fit all these things together really intricately and I try to solve those problems before I write them down because just otherwise if you Every now and then, and this has happened once or twice, I've wound up writing myself in a situation that I couldn't get back out of again. And then I've actually had to say, well, let's try something different. You know, I'll put him in a slightly different situation. Um, but generally, with the big books, I try to solve that ahead of time so I don't have to rip out you know, 200 pages of book to mm -hmm. remove that. Um, so you may say that you don't want to do something like this, but I'm curious which of your epics, Memories Are on Thorn, um, Shadowland or, uh, excuse me, Otherland or Shadow March, would you want to work on and put into the theater as three, four, or eight movies, whatever it would take to do, but <laughs> which would you be most excited to actually work on? 
Well, I, I, I can tell you uh, there's actually two answers to that. The one answer is that right at the moment, um, with George, George Martin's success with the Game of Thrones, um, uh, I'm going to be forced to blow my own horn slightly on this. Um, actually, George has said several times that one of the reasons he wrote the Game of Thrones series was because he had, uh, was involved in the reading my Dragon Bone Chair, those books. And um, I'll tell you a funny story, actually, in just a second. And that was one of the things that said to him, oh, you can still do interesting things in this genre, in this format, which was, and he's always been really nice about that and acknowledging that, even now that he's richer than God. And, <laughs> um, and here's the quick short story, and then I'll answer the question. Um, the first time I met George in person was at a World, World Con, World Science Fiction Con back in the 80s, I think. And I had known, this was, of course, George was not yet famous like he is now, but he was already a very good writer. I'd read several things of his. You know, he'd had several award-winning short stories. Great writer. And those of you who know what George looks like, he, he looked like that then, you know, except Beard was maybe a little less gray and prospectory looking. But he was still big guy, big old grizzled beard, you know, kind of hat pulled down. And uh, so there I was at some convention. And I'm, there's somebody goes, oh, and blah, 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 and that's George. I went, oh my god, that is, it's George Martin. So I walked over to him and I stuck my hand out and said, hey, um, I'm Tad Williams. Real pleasure to meet you. Went, Get the hell out of here. I went, ooh, <laughs> geez. Um, um, and I thought, maybe, I, maybe he's joking, right? And I said, um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I really like your work. I, I've always thought, you know, no, I'm serious. Get the hell out of here. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? And I went, oh God, um, gee, Mr. Martin, I, I'm sorry if I offended you. He goes, I'm waiting for the damn next book. Go home and get writing. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, nightmare scenario suddenly turns around. And, and uh, I, I would like to say it forever endeared him to me, but I'm still terrified of him. I mean, <laughs> I, I like George very much, you know. And, uh, no, 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 no. I would now, but I. Um, it, 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 but anyway, great guy. So, what was the original question? I, mean, I had it. There. Right. Okay. So, because of the success of Game of Thrones and all that, from a commercial point of view, um, this that would be an obvious. The Dragon Bone Chair books would be a very obvious. Um, and again, because of the connection to George and all that, and because they were his inspiration, there's characters in, in the uh, Game of Thrones that are named after characters in those books and stuff like that. Um, however, purely on the basis of what I think would be the most interesting, it would be the Otherland books. Because, and in fact, we had, um, until we had a, a, an option with Warner Brothers on the Otherland books, um, which they let lapse. I, what I found out after they'd got the option was that they thought they might be able to boil it down into one movie, which, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, is kind of like doing the Bible and skipping, I don't know, straight from Genesis to Jesus or something. You know, <laughs> you're missing a lot of material if you try and shorten it that much. Um, other, not otherwise comparing my work to the <laughs> Bible, but um, so. But I think the Otherland books, in a lot of ways, are the kind of the, the, the most interesting and original thing I've had a chance to write at length. And I deliberately wrote them to be a modern epic fantasy. You know, I was writing an epic fantasy a la Tolkien, et cetera, but I wanted to write something that was of my era and nobody else's era. And it sprang very directly out of my time at Apple. I worked in interactive multimedia. I saw the early days of, you know, Jaron Lanier and the Data Glove and, you know, Autodesk and, you know, Jet Propulsion Laboratories, all this kind of stuff. I was doing the rounds. Um, and I remember actually being very struck by something that to this day has informed my interest in, in interactive media, which was uh, one of the very first um, interactive environments that, ha that um, could have more than one person in it. And it was called Reality Built for Two, I think. And this was done in the late 80s. And the guy who was doing the presentation at the conference said, you know, okay, well, once we made this, obviously we got in there. And the first things you do is start looking for like games and stuff to play. So we had catch and all that. And then because the, it had a lot, the, 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 the space had a lot of, the, the people were kind of polygonal, but you could see that they were people. And then there were a lot of polygonal shapes in there. So the next thought everybody had was, oh, well, this would be, we could play hide and go seek, right? 
So people would start playing hide and go seek in this, this reality built for two, these two interactives. Um, and then what the guy said next just floored me. He said, but very quickly, people discovered that the absolute best place to hide was inside the guy you're playing against's head. <laughs> because whoever thinks to look in their own head for the enemy, you know, well, I could have told them differently, but, um, but you know, that was that idea that you didn't, uh, your, your, your physical, your avatar did not have physical mass. So there was nothing to prevent the other character from jumping into you or the other player and just staying inside you while you're like running around looking everywhere going, where the hell is he? You know, he's like, hee 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 in your head. So, or maybe that's just my head where that voice happens. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that really struck me as like, ah, oh, oh, okay, I get it now. We are talking about a new paradigm here. We are not talking about the same old three-dimensional, four-dimensional crap. This is different. So ever since the beginning, uh, I thought, you know, that's a really interesting thing to use as a basis for a very modern approach to fantasy, where literally we are what we think we are. You know, and that's very science fictional, but it also, to me, was something I could make into an epic because literally everybody could create the characters that they wanted to be in this interactive world. So how perfect for you know, epic fantasy quests. So in that sense, I'd love to see, I'd love to see the Otherland books done as like you know, a, a, a mini-series, you know, a cable mini-series or something like that. But, you know... I'll be honest with you, any of them are good because in this day and age, it's, it's really, you know, there's, there's like, if you've only been in books until you hit that next stage where they have, you know, film and other fodder out there for people to find. It's not that, the, it's not that you develop so many fans directly, it's just that you're talked about more and people begin to know about you. So, um, so I'd love to see any of those things happen. And I want to see them finish the Otherland game as well, which is currently stalled at the moment while it's being changed studio. So. Going back to you know, all these different worlds you've created and some of these epics, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I've always thought was great was, was you know, you'd finish the series and I still want more. Uh, do you ever consider going back to these and expanding on them? I mean, you know, there's the trade-off between the, the, the never-ending... Yeah. Um, a uh, story that goes nowhere, and but but sometimes you know, as a reader, you yeah. know, I really want more. If you had asked me that question ten years ago, my answer would have been very different. Um, if you had asked me then, I would have said, "Don't think so." Um, in part because, as you may have gathered from some of the things I said earlier, I. I always feel like I don't have enough time. I've got so many ideas and not enough time. On the other hand, though. What has happened to me recently is I've gotten to a point in my life where I am different enough now from the person who wrote these. Um, you know, I have lived in other countries since then. I have had kids since then, which is a life-changing experience. Um, some might call it a life-destroying experience, but not me. I'm, I'm a braver man than that. Uh, no, I've loved having kids, but I mean, you know, some of these things, it's been, you know, going on 30 years, 25 years since some of these books were written. So um, I now could come to those without feeling like I was franchising my own material. That's always been my thing. I hate when I feel like a writer is writing something because they've got something that's making them money, and if they just keep writing them, the you know, and it's been a problem for me. It's, a lot of publishers have said, Tad, if you would have just kept doing, you know, Ostinard Dragon Bone Chair books, or, you know, oh, everybody liked Tail Chaser Song, just keep writing cat books. I mean, I've had that all through because I, I don't work that way. I follow the idea. But I am at a point now where I am beginning to look at things and say, um, yeah, I could bring a perspective to this. And for me, the cardinal rule has always been, I will not start anything without the story coming first, including something based in a world I've already written. You know? um, but that's kept me from a lot of those because I never had any story ideas. I'm always working on something new. Lately, without going into any details, um, lately some fairly coherent story items uh, have begun to kind of find each other and... Uh, down a few cosmos and get a little friendly and you know um, in the, the the great cocktail party that is the back of my mind based in one of the worlds I've already written about um, but because if I do do this it will be as close to newsworthy as anything that ever happens in my tiny little world 
um, I, I'm not ready to announce yet, but I'm definitely thinking about it very seriously for the first time in many years. So, All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Oh, well, thank you very much awesome. for having me, and very nice to meet you all. And anybody who wants to get a book signed or anything, I'm happy to do that. That's why I'm here. Excellent. All right. He'll be around for a little bit longer. Thank you. Thank you.